Welcome back to Life's Chillin'. My name is Avital, and today we have the honor of speaking with Rabbi Sarah Hurwitz, who made history when she became the first Orthodox Jewish woman to be ordained back in 2009. Rabbi Sarah co-founded Yeshivat Maharat, which is the first institution to ordain Orthodox Jewish women. I found the interview with Rabbi Sarah to be quite inspiring because she had a vision of what she wanted to become and had to create the position for herself because it did not exist before her. And it's really a, a good message, a good lesson for each and every one of us that if we have something that we want to do, even if we have to make the way ourselves, we should pursue those passions and those gifts that God has given us. Welcome back to Life's Chillant. My name is Avital, and today I'm honored to have Rabbi Sara Hurwitz, who is the um, president and co-founder of Yeshivat Maharat and was the first Orthodox Jewish woman to be ordained. Rabbi Sara, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks, Avital. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. So before we get started in sort of the meat of the questions, I thought it'd be very helpful if you could define what is a rabbi and how does it differ if it does differ from a rabbi? Um, a rabbi is a rabbi, so it is not different. Uh, the language is slightly different because in the Orthodox community, we are nervous about the scriptures and language and titles. And so we wanted to find a title that conveyed the rabbinate, spiritual leadership, service, uh, education, deep knowledge and authority. But we wanted to allow the title uh, to be a little bit more flexible so that we could focus on women being able to actually do the work of service. And in fact, I'll just jump in and say that there are many titles that are used by female rabbis in the Orthodox community. Um, sometimes they're full rabbis, sometimes it's maharat, sometimes it's rabbanit, sometimes it's uh, a, a, an entirely different title that doesn't even sound like rabbi. But what we've, we're focused on is the job, and the job is serving the Jewish community. Well, that's wonderful, and that was going to be one of my questions about those different terms and if there was a difference between the terms or if it was just something that is personal preference? Well, it's not that it's personal preference. I would say it's, it's, it's uh, what, what the community in which the rabbi is serving is ready for. And so uh, what we discovered is it's just a lightning rod. Uh, it's just a lightning rod to use for women to use titles. In fact, Especially this week, we know that there's a lot of controversy over Jill Biden being called doctor. Um, not that she should be, the controversy isn't whether she should be called doctor, but those who question uh, that title. And so we, we know across the board that title is important and necessary to help define what somebody can do and bring to the world. And yet it still brings up a lot of of questions and um, misogyny in others. Absolutely, I think that's a great example. So I would love to hear a little bit, a bit about your journey. Um, why did you decide you wanted to become a rabbi? How did that journey unfold and sort of where you are today? Well, the I, I didn't wake up one day and decided I wanted to be a rabbi. Um, there wasn't a mentor or model of Orthodox female rabbinic leadership. Um, and so, you know, the quick story is that I was born and raised in South Africa. We left in 1989 before apartheid fell. And um, by doing so, we moved to South Florida. My parents sent me a strong message of tolerance and equality that all people should be and do what they dream of. And I didn't know that would translate to the rabbinate, so to speak. Um, but I did have to take a, a one of these vocational tests before I went to, to Barnard to Columbia College. And um, the results of the test showed I was best suited for clergy. And so uh, we wasn't quite sure what an orthodox young woman was going to do with that. But I pursued a um, other things in college, but ultimately found my calling in in serving and building and Jewish and and um, serving the Jewish community. Um, I think one thing that was necessary in order to to fulfill a direction that I was interested in going was to learn more and to become more knowledgeable in Jewish text. 
Um, and so I spend a lot of time learning first at Trisha and then um, privately under the auspices of Rabbi Weiss um, and was ultimately after five years of serving at the Hebrew Institute of Riverdale while still learning, I was ordained in 2009. That's amazing. That's quite a journey that you went through and definitely you sort of made history within the Orthodox Jewish community, within the Jewish community in general, um, when, when you did that. How did you, I saw that you were ordained by Rabbi Daniel Sperber and by Rabbi R. Avi Weiss. So how did it end up being? Did you find them? Did they find you? Was it mutual? Um, well, I started working at the Hebrew Institute of Riverdale as a congregational intern in 2003. And nobody knew what I was interning for, um, but I loved doing the work of being part of community. And after a year of being there, Rabbi Weiss was the senior rabbi, the rabbi at the time, and we were walking and we were both dreaming about the possibility of what would it look like for me to be an accepted member of the clergy. Neither of us knew what it would look like. In fact, I was hesitant that people would come to me for their spiritual needs or life cycle events. Um, I, I felt like people still pictured rabbi with a beard, um, but I was, I was wrong. And what I found is after being in the community for many years, um, it was about connections and relationships that were built over time. Um, and so after studying under Rabbi Weiss's auspices, I, um, I finished all of my relevant tests. And I took a oral test with Rabbi Daniel Sperber, who I think was really excited and willing and interested to uh, ordain women. Um, and after taking all the relevant tests, they both um, ordained me. Um, we actually had a public ceremony, and this was important to my journey. Um, I remember saying to Rabbi Weiss, you know, I could go back and just um, continue to serve the HIR and our community, which had been so supportive of my growth. Um, and I can just continue doing that, or we can help other women understand that this is a career path, a trajectory that they could follow. And so we decided to have a public ceremony in which others came and celebrated. We celebrated Tara, women's Tara learning, as well as leadership. And at that event, people said, all right, how do I do this? Where do I sign up? And so um, Rabbi Weiss and I, the very next day, announced the opening of, of Yeshivat Maharat. Um, and to our surprise, we received many applications. And um, just a few months later, in September 2009, we, we opened our doors to continue on the journey of ordaining Orthodox women. I know that was much more than you asked. Oh, that's amazing. I love it. I, I want to come back to your journey a little bit more in a minute. But since you brought up Yeshivat Maharat, Tell us a little bit about what it is and what what you what you do there and what are the programs that women can t take part of. So it's the first um, institution in America to ordain Orthodox women, and uh, our mission is to uh, recruit, educate, and ordain, and then send send women out into the Jewish community writ large, not only in the Orthodox community but as Hillel rabbis, as chaplains, as um, organizational leaders, as well as in pulpits in the Orthodox community to serve as rabbinic leaders. Um, Maharat, it, our core program is a, an immersive four-year program. Um, we have the opportunity to do it online or, or in person in New York. And we have also grown to include a program for beginners and a program for those who are advanced and maybe dreamed about about doing this kind of work many years ago, but had to pick a different career because this wasn't um, available to them. And so wanted to give them an opportunity while they were working, while they're working to, to uh, uh, get the credentials necessary to, to be called, you know, a clergy, a member of the clergy. Uh, we also actually have this year a great program um, for, for people who are not interested in smicha. Um, or an ordination for men and women, actually, who just want to deepen their Torah knowledge. Um, it's called Mind the Gap. So if you just want to spend the morning or the afternoon engaged in, in deep Torah wisdom with 
fantastic teachers, check us out. Mind the gap. Wonderful. And, and the website is yeshivamaharat.org. Everybody should go check it out and look at the wonderful programming that they are doing. So you in particular, but also for women who are still in these programs today, do you feel that you had to work harder or study harder, something to prove yourself more since you were an early leader as a woman in the Jewish community and sort of the clergy um, than, than maybe your male counterparts? Um, I think women in general tend to be a little more scrutinized. The bar is a little bit higher. And I did feel like a lot of eyes <laughs> were on the success, not only of me and my career, but also at, uh, it, on the first few graduates of Maharat. Um, and I think that the experience of many of us is that we have to work harder and we have to prove ourselves more than our male colleagues. Yeah, absolutely. And it was interesting when I was doing a little bit of research about this, it's something that came up and I don't know if this is still true, but that there were sort of three things that Jewish women who are leaders can't sort of partake in that men can, which was um, participating in a minion, um, in a quorum of 10, serving on a bait dean, which is sort of the Jewish religious court, and leading some parts of the prayer services. So first, is that still the case? So I chose to be part of the Orthodox community. It's a community that I think nourishes me and serves me. It's my pr prayer community. And uh, I, there's a lot of like-mindedness with certainly within the Orthodox community. Um, and there's parts of our tradition that I've accepted um, as, as being part of the, uh, you know, as being an Orthodox Jew. Um, and that includes women not being counted in a minion or sitting on a beit din or leading certain parts of services. But there's so much that a woman can do and so much work that female rabbinic leaders can do. Um, I have to say in the age of Zoom, uh, some of my students and colleagues are running minyanim on Zoom because there is no such thing as a minion on Zoom. And so they're leading and davening and, um, and leading services in beautifully spiritual ways. Um, and so, you know, there are some silver linings in the way in which we're building community these days. Absolutely. That's very cool. I guess what I was asking in a sense was because I was curious as to, since you were the first in your position, whether you had to do the halachic research, the legal, the Jewish legal research into seeing what can I do, what can't I do, or if someone had done that research for you. So I care very much about halacha, about Jewish law, and I didn't want to do anything that was counter to a tradition that I've bought into. And so before I set, set on this, myself on this path, I certainly did research into can women be rabbis? What are the functions that rabbis perform and within those functions what can women not perform what are the differences what are the similarities um, and so in fact on our website we asked other rabbis to write what we call chuvat or responsa um, to lay out some of the halachic groundwork for why the foundation for why women can be rabbis but i myself has have also created and and have really gone around um, the world, uh, conveying and teaching others why it's okay for women to function in this capacity. Oh, that's amazing. It's, um, it, it was, I, I don't remember which book I was reading, but it was very interesting to, I'll have to leave the information for it in the description. It was very interesting to go through that sort of halachic argument of the points of why women can be leaders and where we see that in biblical instances and whatnot. Um, so it's interesting because from, from the way I've seen it, at least has been that the position of a rabbi or of a female clergy member is not fully accepted in certain parts of the Jewish community. Why do you think that is that despite a lot of the halacha that supports it, it still faces backlash? Um, it's hard for me to speak for other people, so I want to just give that caveat that I'm not sure what's in people's hearts and minds. Um, 
You know, I think that that anything new is scary. And I think that Maharat is now in its 12th year. We're in our bat mitzvah celebratory year. Um, and I think that we focused on putting facts on the ground is helping people understand what what female leadership is and what it isn't. Um, but also helping the community see that we're only strengthened by being able to draw upon the talents and wisdom of 100% of the population. Um, and I think that, you know, the world writ large sometimes fears um, women's strong leadership or evolution into, into positions that had been um, traditionally held by men. And so, Anything new and different, I think, is met with a lot of questions. And our job and my job has been just to keep moving forward to, uh, you know, I know that not everybody is going to to accept Orthodox women in every circle of the Orthodox community. Um, but more and more are and are seeing that not only is it acceptable, but it is enhancing the experience of, of the communities they are part of. I think that was a great answer. And it was a tough question, my apologies. I have two more tough questions and then only easy ones after that. Um, so one of them is that, so in, in 1972, there was the first female rabbi, Sally Presand, and she was from the reform movement. So I'm not the best at calculating math in my head, but roughly 40 years later, you became the first female rabbi um, in the Orthodox community. Why do you think it took so long in the sense of, I mean, 40 years is a relatively short period of time, but at the same time, why do you think it took until you to have somebody take that leadership role within the Orthodox Jewish community? So first of all, I am so privileged to know Rabbi Sally Pizand, Rabbi Sandy Sasso, Rabbi, Rabbi Amy Alberg from each of the other movements, and we've had the opportunity to travel together, to speak together, and really learn from one another. So that's, that's just been a, a privilege. Um, and also to compare how our stories are have so many points of similarity, um, even, even when there are, are, are slight differences as well. Um, you know, it's only been a hundred years until, since women even got the vote. And so sometimes I have to remind myself to step back and see uh, how much has changed in a in hundred years. Um, and it, that, that speaks to my, it speaks to how sometimes I can be very patient. And I think that has helped me get to where I am today. Um, but it also speaks to my impatience. And sometimes I, I want things to change. Um, I want the community to change a little faster and for more women to be in these positions of, of leadership. Um, but I think that, that, you know, th there is a lot about the right person and the right time. Um, Rabbi Weiss is a, the, a, a tremendous mentor for me. And I think that I had fire in my belly to try to bring about, um, you know, I don't even see myself as a trailblazer, but I had, I had fire in my belly to, um, to really do something big in the, in the community. And I, I didn't want to wait. I didn't want to wait for a institution to open up and to start accepting Orthodox women. And uh, I realized that if I wanted to, to service the community and I wanted other women to have a credential pathway um, to figure out how to get the knowledge or to go out and serve the community, then I would have to do it myself. Absolutely. That's amazing. And you've now paved the way for, do you have a number on how many women you've ordained so far? Yeah, we have 43 women out in the field and we'll have um, six more this June and we have um, another, um, you know, close to, close to 40 coming up through the pipe. And that's amazing, really amazing. So there's another position that's different um, that is, I would say, quite widely accepted for Jewish Orthodox women, which is as a yoetz at halacha, or sort of like a, a sort of legal advisor in through Jewish law um, that is typically woman to woman. And that's pretty widely accepted usually as a woman to woman um, experience or interaction. So for the people who are skeptics, what can 
a rabbah bring to men specifically in a community that maybe they wouldn't be getting from a male rabbi? Uh, I want to also just step back and say any form of female leadership is all good. So I whether agree. through your know, etzet halacha or smicha or you know ordination or not ordination, I think any platform where women can bring their full selves and um, their wisdom and leadership is is better for our community. I agree. Um, and second, um, I think that I think that as I. I think that the question, the premise of the question that women have something unique to offer is, is interesting, but maybe the question is what can individuals bring uniquely to the job? Um, and I think that the community has, is diverse. The Orthodox community, the, the Jewish community at large is diverse. And, and I think um, different people gravitate to different kinds of personalities. And so, you know, it could, when I, I'm just thinking about my own evolution, when I first came to the Hebrew Institute of Riverdale to the buy it, it's possible that only women asked me questions or gravitated towards me. Certainly I'm on the female side, the woman's side of the mechitza, of the divider during, during prayer services. And so there's, it's natural to be able to stand next to a woman who's reciting Kaddish or put my arm around when we could put our arms around people. Um, <laughs> And, and so there, there is a, a natural pathway um, that brought me closer to women initially. But I think that my job was about creating a certain sense and avira, a certain feel in a community for the community writ large. Um, and it, it did not take long for, for men to, to stop seeing me as female as the female rabbi, but as just the rabbi, as a member of the team, as a member of the clergy. And I think that's my hope is that all of us um, are gonna be invited to speak, not because we're women or men, but because we have wisdom and expertise to share out into the world. I love that answer. You're very, you are very correct. It is about a lot more than gender, a lot more about personalities and personality types working well together. Um, than it is, again, about gender. So I like that answer. What advice do you have for other women who are wanting to become a rabbah or leaders in their community? Uh, first of all, step one is ask yourself, do you love Jewish people? Um, and I think if you love the Jewish people enough to want to serve or to give back, then um, I think this might be a pathway, a trajectory for you. And I think the second question to ask is, do you love learning? Do you love being engaged in the intellectual pursuit of Torah? Do you like to feel that you can own the Torah and be an authority on it? Um, and the third question that I would ask is, are you ready to engage with and be a representative of, of, of what we think God wants for us in the world and to bring in um, talking about, about God into a world that I think is, is searching and seeking for spiritual meaning? That's a great answer along sort of similar lines. And you did sort of mention a little bit about what you are hoping to see in the future, but what do you hope to see in the future in, in the Orthodox, um, in terms of Orthodox Jewish women in these leadership roles? What do you hope to see change? What do you hope to see evolve? What do you hope to see stay the same? So I am really interested in strong leadership in general. And I am looking forward to a time where men and women are sitting equally at the communal table, um, thinking, planning, uh, servicing together. Um, and I think that that you know gender is is such a a fiery topic now, as we just saw um, this week with again referencing the the first lady to be's um, title. But I, I guess. Like my dream and desire is that we as a, as a, as a community are, are building a robust 21st century um, community where that services the needs of, of the people who are tapping in today. And what I think that looks like is people who are, like I said before, are, are seeking meaning, are seeking something that Jewish tradition has to has to offer, but through the language that 
um, that we're living and speaking today of inclusivity, of equity, of justice, um, and and being a a a funnel and a um, you know a, a vessel to to bring those ideas out into the world. Well, that's beautiful. I would love to see that happen. See that sort of dream become reality. So. Is there anything else you would like to add? I'm new to this topic as well. There, you might say I missed something big. Is there anything else that you'd like to add or to share with us? Um, nope, I think you got it. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Rabba Sara, for being here with us today, for telling us about your journey and sharing wonderful insights with us. Again, if you would like to learn more about Yeshiva Maharat, please visit yeshivamaharat.org. I will leave it in the description below. And it was truly a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you, and good luck out there. Thank you.